Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm Peter Wallace, and with us today is Matthew Skinner. Matthew is Associate Professor of New Testament at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, and an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA. Matt, thanks for talking with us. Thanks for having me. You've done a lot of work in the relationship of the Bible and the local church. You said pastors and lay leaders must help their congregations understand that Scripture is not a relic, but it's uh, a living text, and we can experience it as it works on us and in us. But how does the text do that? How is it alive, and how does it work on us, first of all? Yeah, well, I think the short answer is it can happen differently for every person, mm -hmm. right? So anybody who's ever preached before knows that sometimes the outcome of a sermon is not what you thought it was going to be, and, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Sometimes God is at work in ways that in spite of the preacher or through the preacher in ways that, that she or he might not be, be expecting. So on the one hand, it's, it's there's kind of wild unpredictability about it, I think. Just because of the nature of the text is a text where it's going to touch people in different ways, mm -hmm. and especially when we think about the text as a story, you know, not just the narrative parts, the Gospels or Acts, but the rest of it, you know, in Paul's letters or the, the oracles of a prophet take us into real people's lives and their hopes and dreams, we're going to connect with that based upon our own experience in one way, shape, or form. So, and it's not always the same, you know, mm -hmm. so my background shapes what I'm going to see, what I'm going to value, your background's going to shape what you see, and not that there's a kind of, not that there's an everything goes mm -hmm. aspect to it, uh, but there's, but a, there's a multiplicity, an absolute freedom, yeah. right, that I think comes out when a preacher or a teacher Avoid saying, it means only this, mm -hmm. believe it, and we're done, you know, and check off, got it, I got Mark chapter 4 done, I can move on, you know, but, but says, you know, how does this, um, where do you see your life reflected in this? Where do you see your hopes reflected in this? Where do you see fears reflected in this text? And is there a promise, you know, and warning in the text, both for the ancient Israelites, the first century church, or whoever, but also somehow still for you. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm interested mm -hmm. in, is mm -hmm. how through, and less about historical study, but more a lot of literary and rhetorical work mm -hmm. with a biblical text, how does it connect, and what images does it conjure for us? Mm -hmm. uh, what memories, and how, what does it make us want to tell somebody else about? You know, and so it's not just something that we keep to ourselves, but say, you know, I heard this when I read mm -hmm. this, and you heard that. And it's my experience that that's where stuff starts to happen, where people get uh, both excited about what they're reading, or at least interested in what they're reading, but then also start to imagine, what if this is really what God is like, and what mm -hmm. if this is really who we are, and what if this is really, what if this text describes a, a way where it's possible for us to be community together? You mentioned the historical and cultural context of the text. I'm wondering, as pastors and lay leaders help congregations understand the text and how it affects them um, do they need to help the lay people understand that context as clearly as possible or is you know sometimes we get stuck there and we don't see where it is affecting us today right right I think there is a, a, a place where you do that where you fill people in on the information uh, I tell my students often, that the, know you, the know you more, the more you will see. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that you've got to have expert credentials before we're going to let you touch the Bible. But, you know, the more that you read around and the more that you know about the history, you're going to start to notice more stuff. It mm -hmm. might not all be interesting or relevant mm -hmm. stuff, but it's worth talking about. So, you know, sometimes that's as simple as helping people know what a denarius is mm -hmm. and what it's worth, you know. And, coinage and stuff. Right. Sometimes it's helpful to know a little bit about, um, I don't know, social customs. And so what's going on in the, the, the parable of the prodigal son that's bizarre and what's expected. Um, so I think the more we do that, we can help, I don't want to say correct, but maybe, you know, hone and direct uh, people's interpreting to, so it's more informed and so it's more accurate. But I don't ever want to think that uh, 
somebody who's barely literate might get more out of a biblical story and might discover spiritual truths just as well as or in some cases better than, mm-hmm. you know, I can given all the you know, training and stuff that goes into that. So that there's a kind of openness that always has to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I would argue that the role of a preacher and teacher is also to just to open up new vistas. Mm-hmm. So here's some information. What does that mm-hmm. change? You know, what, is this, what do you make of that? Does this change anything? Uh, and can be done in a way that's not overwhelming or, or oppressive or don't forget I'm the expert in the room. <laughs> Right, but is is genuine and inviting and generous. Mm-hmm. Is there any danger that in doing that, that we alienate the listener from the text? In other words, they see that the context is so foreign to my life. I, you know, I don't live in that land. I don't live in that time. Um, I'm not living in an agricultural you know, economy right. and, and that sort of right. thing. Um, is there a danger where if we take it too far that, you know, maybe people will be alienated from the, the meaning that they can gain? I think there is, you know, a danger of that, but I think it's, I think it's worth the risk, mm. to be honest. Uh, I've, you know, I'm deeply influenced by Walter Brueggemann's mm-hmm. notion of, <clears throat> I might be changing his words around, but you make the text strange, then you make it familiar again. And so part of mm-hmm. what you have to do is realize the kind of otherness of the text and the weirdness of the text, both in terms of the cultural stuff, right? People who lived 2,000 years ago and more, they're just just—they're not like us. Mm-hmm. They are in some ways, of course, mm-hmm. but for the most part, they're not burdened by the same kinds of questions or concerns that we are, and nor are we perhaps burdened with theirs. So... We never recognize that the culture is different, the, the values are sometimes different, and even God is different. Mm-hmm. So where it can be helpful in that, that kind of dislocation is to make us think, oh yeah, maybe God's always more than our little th- mm-hmm. systems allow. Maybe God's even more than our theology sometimes allows or our confessions allow. I'm not saying throw all of those out, but mm-hmm. those are always, for me at least, always open-ended. They're always provisional. They're always meant to help us know what to expect with God, but never to box God in. Right. So I I worry about a Christianity that is too complacent, not only in terms of its social witness, but also in terms of its understanding of who God is. We've got God figured out, right? We've been Mm -hmm. tracking God for a couple Mm -hmm. thousand years. We think we know, you know, which, uh, what a terrible (laughs) place to be in. First of all, you're going to get yourself surprised, I imagine, Mm -hmm. by God, but also that's not faith as I understand it. So if by using the Bible we can, I use use in quotes, the the way we work with the Bible, we can always get people to think, hey, there's more here. Hey, it might be different. You've got to inhabit a different kind of way of thinking or reality. This is the parables Mm -hmm. that Jesus tells force us into worlds and economies where common sense or conventional wisdom isn't what it's supposed to be, that it's this kind of alternative way of imagining what if it's all like something else, right? What if relationships can function really differently? Uh, what if God really is gracious and merciful and that in, that comes in ways that utterly surprise us and even offend us at times, right. you know? So it's a way of rousing us to attention, which has a pastoral function, I think. And I think it's also just an authentic way of reading these texts, that they are, they are weird. <laughs> we, you know, we invest so much effort into making the Bible accessible, as we should, mm-hmm all sorts of study Bibles for all sorts of subgroups in our population, as we probably should. Uh, but it's still a weird book, mm-hmm. right? It's, um, to me, that's part of the fun yeah. is to inhabit that right. and to say, uh, what does it mean to say we follow the same God that these people did out of their very different context mm-hmm. and that their words in the Bible continue to inform how we encounter and how we meet and understand God that's the, that's the making it familiar again, mm-hmm. right? Once mm-hmm. you've made it strange, you say, now this book is your book, mm-hmm. right? And the God described here is your God. Uh, your world, your experience counts. It matters. How does the God in this book, or how does this book itself give definition to or inform your life today? That's the creative work that preaching has to help people mm-hmm. do. It doesn't, it's not the only place where it happens, but that's... That's why I care about preaching as a biblical scholar, right? Because mm. this is how most people get this weird text 
mediated to them or presented to them. You've also said that interpreting the Bible is absolutely central to a local church's interpretation of itself, and you emphasize a conversational approach to scriptural understanding, which is a far cry from the hierarchical approach of days past. But what happens when we take this approach in our local congregation? What happens when we take a conversational approach? Uh, well, we fight. Yeah. <laughs> it's one thing. You know, it's easier to live with an established authoritative biblical interpreter who gets to make the rules. I mean, in terms mm -hmm. of community mm -hmm. harmony, it can be a lot easier than if I like the church, I'll join it. If not, I'll go somewhere else, you know. And so we all know what that looks like. We've seen it function in that way. So it's messy when, when we say the work of interpreting scripture belongs to the whole community, and that's best done in a communal setting, which can be anything mm -hmm. from a Sunday school classroom you know, to a council or a session meeting, to even a sermon itself and coffee hour. I mean, if scripture really can imbue our life together, uh, I think it's going to be contentious at times. It's going to be messy and dirty. We're going to disagree. Mm -hmm. We're going to be challenged. <clears throat> but what that does, and I'm really shaped by a former teacher of mine, Don Jewell, who said what that does is it forces us to articulate not just this is what I think scripture is about, or this is what I think are the right methods for interpreting scripture, or here are my values that I won't sacrifice as I think about God or ethics or whatever. It also forces us to say, this is who I think God is, right? To kind of, to lay out our understanding. So you, I think we learn pretty quickly when we listen carefully to ourselves and to each other that behind our hermeneutics, our theories of interpretation is a theology that imagines who this God is, mm -hmm. and that's what it's finally about for me. So um, are there some ways of interpreting the Bible that imagine God to be more gracious than other interpretations that imagine God to be a little bit more vindictive or aloof or capricious? You know, I, I want to talk about those. I'm not saying I know what the answer is to exactly who God is, mm -hmm. but the truth, I think, is is found throughout that discovery and that conversation with scripture. I don't want to throw out the old knowledge. I want to bring that into a kind of ever renewing conversation about ourselves and our lives. Having that sort of a congregational conversation requires the church leader to kind of uh, give up a little bit of authority in some way. Mm -hmm. True. I think so. Maybe I would change the word from authority to control. Yeah, that's the word. <laughs> How about that? So I think yeah. those are two different yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, a church word. leader has an authority by virtue of his or her office mm -hmm. on one level, more so his or her character, mm -hmm. right? The office mm -hmm. will only get you mm -hmm. so far. You've got to be the person. But authority can manifest itself or exercise it, itself in ways that are freeing, that, that surrender over control so but i do think it does give a, a weight control it, it i think a pastor i think a pastor has to say i might know a lot more about this book than you all <laughs> <laughs> uh, but i might be wrong yeah. about this interpretation or a pastor might say i think this the inter the, the tradition says that got to keep these in conversation. Now, that doesn't happen in every sermon. I don't, mm -hmm. I'm right. not saying your sermons have to be, here are the five things that could mean, take <laughs> your pick. The pastor's always contending for his or her vision, and the sermon is a place where I think the pastor has been charged to do that, you know, come bring mm -hmm. us a word. Um, but that happens only as a result of other conversations that are taking place throughout the week and in mm -hmm. the life of the church. So part of what the pastor is doing is collecting perspectives. Right. And part of what the pastor's doing by proclaiming on a Sunday morning is to say, this is what I've heard from you all. This is how I think the text is working among you. This is how the text is describing us in our situation mm -hmm. right now. And some of that are, are, comes from things the pastor's heard from the people. Mm -hmm. Might be correcting along the way. I, I'll mm -hmm. always give a pastor the freedom to, to do that. But. Sure. So that's how I would, would put it. It requires uh, the pastor to... Uh, be out there among the people, and it requires the pastor to be thinking about, um, just to be thinking imaginatively about what the text is doing, what God is doing. Now, you are a Presbyterian minister and earned a Master of Divinity and a doctorate from Princeton Theological Seminary. How did you end up at 
Luther Seminary? Uh, the short answer is they were hiring. <laughs> and I was looking for a job. Uh, which but you've is, been here uh, quite a while now. I've been at Luther for nine years. Yeah. yeah uh, I don't know exactly how I got hired. You have to talk to the people <laughs> involved or God about that. But I'll tell you why I was interested in it. it I, I, went, I got my PhD out of a sense of call, out of a sense of responding to call, where I, I love teaching, I love the study, and I really thought I might be called to be in a position where I could be influence, influencing not just academia, but also uh, churches, mm -hmm. communities of faith, denominations. And so I hoped I would be able to be at a seminary. I thought that would be a place where I could perhaps have the most kind of influence or leverage mm -hmm. to do that. But the job marketing, market being what it was, you don't ever presume. You know, it's, right. And so when the position was open at Luther, it seemed the right fit for me. Here was a school that um, has high academic standards, has great faculty, and a strong commitment to what does the church mm -hmm. need from its leadership, which uh, really excites me because I, you know, as we've talked about and as I've said in other places, I think one of the ways in which the church will be renewed and sustained for whatever lies ahead of us is through a creative engagement with Scripture, mm -hmm. that the church understands itself as called into being by God, partly through this book, uh, that we see ourselves as people who are always contending with this book. Like I, I use the adjective messy all the time mm -hmm. with my students, that Sometimes you sit and you let the text just wash over you and it's great and it's healing and there's words of comfort and grace and, and peace there. And sometimes you gotta fight back and you gotta push back and you gotta say, no, I don't think so, or this doesn't square with that. And what is, what's up with God here in this text? Um, and I, I, I find, a, um, I guess, a warrant for that in the pages of scripture itself where you see people contending with right. God. So, uh, so Luther seemed to me a place where I could go and help shape imaginations about scripture as well as help inform people about scripture uh, and help people use it differently than they might have thought, you know, to move away from the, the answer book mentality or to help people move away from, you know, the kind of, you know, scripture was nice in its time, but we've really become too sophisticated for it now and mm -hmm. it's outlived its usefulness. I mean, I want to call those people back to an engagement with scripture and say, maybe the problem's not with scripture, it's maybe the problem's with the lack of imagination mm -hmm. on our part in terms of how we relate this to our lives. And Luther's a big enough place and not solely a Lutheran place that I could be comfortable there and that I could um, find a variety of students to, to learn from and to teach. What fascinates you most about the New Testament? Is, <clears throat> is there a particular <laughs> part of the New Testament that, that grabs you the most? Yeah, I... Or, or is that like asking which one was your favorite child? Who's your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not going to answer. I won't say all the New Testament's my favorite part, so <laughs> there's that. You know, I was drawn to, to New Testament studies uh, out of an interest in narrative. Hmm. Um, it was when I discovered as an MDiv student that studying the New Testament isn't just a historical enterprise. It's not just about learning the language and the geography and figuring out uh, you know, what a shekel is and what the temple looked like, that part of it was understanding the rhetoric of the text and understanding the ways in which the, the New Testament itself preserves, in my mind, not necessarily, um, uh, you know, a, a, a chronicle of exactly mm -hmm. what, it's not a reporter's mm -hmm. notebook, it's not a, a transcript, it's a testimony mm -hmm. of people's experiences with Jesus the Holy Spirit with the church, trying to give voice to this is how I think God is active in this person, Jesus Christ, in this gospel that he proclaimed. And how that quickly jumps into questions of imagination, creativity, a personal, a sense of personal experience and room for personal experience, um, how it connects to how cultures work and how battles get fought within mm -hmm. cultures, that all of that is at play on the page in front of me, but also behind it in the history of it. I just find that fascinating, mm -hmm. partly because I think it aligns with my theology of a God who is fully incarnate, right, who, who doesn't become body and then stay removed from culture or politics mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or human debate and things like that, but is enmeshed in it. Um, that God's not above, you know, getting hands dirty and that kind of work. 
I think we see that in the pages of scripture, which gives me hope for my own life of wondering, you know, where is God in this moment? Uh, where is God when I leave church Sunday morning and go out to live my life in the quote unquote real world? You know, mm -hmm. God is in the midst of all of this. It's sometimes in very surprising ways. Um, uh, it's really unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. Matt Skinner, thank you for talking with us. Well, thanks for talking with me. Appreciate it.